pick up Romans 13. We're going to finish Romans um, about faith and works um, because, well, pretty much from here it's downhill. So I'll finish this, I hope, and we'll get started right now. So we've been talking about Jew and Gentile, and that's because that's what Romans is talking about. We mentioned in the first part of Romans 13 how that governing authority is now authority. And the Jews who had up until this point been used to the Israelite theocracy are now getting used to the Roman Empire. Um, this is where Romans 13.8 picks up. Oh, no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. It's the fulfillment of the law of Moses to love your neighbor as yourself. The commandments are calling for the love of the neighbor. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love is therefore fulfilling the law, Romans 13, 10. All right, so there's that. There is also a reminder in 11 to 14 that the day is gone, or uh, the night is gone, the day is spent. Uh, you know, cast off works of darkness, put on armor of light. It's time to stand up and do the right thing. Let us do what is right, as in the daytime. And the 14th verse, put on the Lord Jesus, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Meaning, you don't pack your bags for that trip. Don't even make preparation. So that you get to the 14th chapter, as for the one who is weak, in faith welcome him, not to quarrel over opinions. And this is one where I'm going to take issue with the translation and... Uh, you know, I'm just going to. Uh, there's every reason to do so. Uh, anybody who wants to talk about Greek is welcome to ask me about this. But basically, uh, this should say, in the faith, welcome one who is weak. That's what it should say. Uh, I realize that what it says is welcome one who's weak in faith. But that's not true. That's not what it says. It says, in the faith, welcome one who is weak. And the significance of that is um, like the significance of that passage in, in uh, Peter about the wife as the weaker vessel. It's not that she is weak or even weaker than the husband, whether that be necessarily, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever. It's the vessel that is weaker. The vessel is a role that a person plays. You know, the vessel is the, the thing that the potter creates out of the clay. It's, it's the role. Somebody plays the lead role. Somebody plays supporting actor, right? Somebody plays whatever role. There are lots of roles. So um, it's not weak in the sense of sinful or weak in the sense of failure to stand for God uh, in any way. It's weak by role, weak by position. In this case, what we specifically mean is the second verse. One person believes he may eat anything. The weak person eats only vegetables. Eating only vegetables is the position of weakness um, because it's difficult to get all the nutrition you need, especially in the ancient world, without eating some kind of meat. Um, so the person who eats vegetables only has a hard time. Um, they're in a position of weakness. They're, they're compromised in that sense that, you know, if the crops fail, um, if it's hard to get produce, if they can't find produce with the nutrition that they need, sufficient protein, specifically, or iron, uh, they're going to have a hard time uh, getting what they need in terms of their own uh, health and vitality, etc., etc., so they're, because they do not wish to eat meat in Rome, they are weak. They're in a position of weakness. It's not a commentary on whether or not they believe in God. They obviously do believe in God. That's why they're not eating meat. The reason they're not eating meat is because they are formerly Jewish and they have been living and eating kosher all of their lives. And they are not interested in starting to eat meat, even though the Lord will allow it now because the fulfillment of the law is to love one another. Um, 
that's why they are in a position of weakness. So this also is about Jew and Gentile. The fifth verse shows you one person esteems one day better than another. Another esteems all days alike. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. One who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. One who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. One who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and still gives thanks to God. We're talking about, yeah, the kosher eating and the days, the, the holidays. Say, you know, they don't want to work on a Saturday. They're accustomed to not working Saturday, taking that day and devoting it to the worship of God. It's fine to do that. You can do that. That's what he's saying. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. You observe it, you observe it in honor of the Lord. Fine. If you're willing to eat meat and you give God thanks, we'll do it. Honor the Lord by giving thanks. So this is helping them to understand how they're going to get along with differing ways of approaching um, these customs of food and uh, days, you know, holidays, things of this nature. These are the law, the law of Moses. They're customs that these people have kept all their lives. There's no reason they have to stop doing it. They do, they do have to know that God allows them to do it. That the Gentiles, who are now Christians, who are eating ham sandwiches, are not sinning. It is not sinful to eat ham. You don't have to eat it. But it's not sinful. And it's not sinful to observe the Sabbath in the sense of staying home, devoting yourself to prayer and to study. That's not wrong. You can do that. But it is wrong to bind it. You're not required to do it. And so you have the fourth, uh, the tenth verse. Why do you pass judgment on your brother on the one hand? Or you on the other hand, why do you despise your brother? So one person condemns the other and what he's doing. The other one looks down on the other like, you poor thing, if only you understood. Right? He's saying these are both the wrong attitude. You're allowed to eat. You're allowed to abstain. You're allowed to observe. You're allowed to go on with your day. These are both acceptable so long as you give thanks to God. So why pass judgment or why despise? Everybody stands before this judgment seat of Christ or of God. Each will give account of himself to God. That's Romans 14, 12. So, 13th verse, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Rather, let's decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus. Nothing is unclean in and of itself. It is unclean for anyone who thinks it to be unclean. So this is about how you treat one another. And it's still about Jew and Gentile. He knows in the Lord Jesus, the foods are clean. They're not unclean in and of themselves. Whatever food it is, all the meats are acceptable. Uh, keeping, you know, the observance of the Jewish holidays as prescribed in the law of Moses is not a sinful thing. It is clean to do that. But it's unclean for any who thinks it to be unclean, as in, we're not going to do this to the point where we're flaunting that in somebody's face, uh, you know, or holding it over them or looking down upon them because they choose to go the vegetarian route rather than having to try to figure out whether this meat is clean. That's why the 15th verse says what it does. If your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. Because the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is the idea. They're allowed to eat, they're allowed to not eat, they're allowed to observe or not observe. Either way, they have to understand that God accepts them all. And that this is not what the kingdom of God is about. 
where under the law of Moses, these things were required and it was a matter of sin. It is not so in the Lord. We have fulfilled those symbols and those types and patterns that were intended to teach us about the Lord. And so that has been loosed and, and we're back to, you know, the Noahite code where you can eat everything. <laughs> That's why the 19th says, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. The 20th verse, everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another person stumble by what he eats. So you, you just, yeah, you can eat, but don't make trouble for somebody else based on your diet. <laughs> what and, and that's, you say, well, we just don't have that problem today. Well, that's not really true. There's going to be any number of things that are, you know, traditional, that are cultural, that are you know, habits and things that we have formed that are based on our families, our heritage, our traditions, uh, that are not really matters of scripture and of truth. And we'll be doing those things sometime at some point, somebody who's not part of the same culture will come along and there's going to be some problem, some misunderstanding, something of this nature. You have to be able to discern the difference between what the Bible commands and binds upon us and things that are just, well, that just happens to be how we were doing it. So that you're not drawing lines that God doesn't draw. Um, that's what this is about. And again, uh, it really closes in the 15th uh, chapter because you read there in verse one, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself either, as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached God fell on me. Yeah, if you're in the position of the strong, as in, you know, you have the uh, easier time in this culture, for whatever reason. If a Gentile moved to Israel, he might have a hard time with not being able to eat some of the things that were allowed. It's possible he could be the person who's in a position of weakness. Or, you know, if he doesn't have the clothing that fulfills the requirements, he's going to have to get some. If he's low on funds, that could be a problem, right? It's just saying that's the person then who is weak. They're in the position of weakness in that in that case. In this case, they're in Rome, so the person who can't eat unkosher is the one who's at a disadvantage. That's the position of weakness there. So yeah, this is going to move around and change depending on where you are and what the customs are in that place, and that's just how it is. When you are in the position of the strong, as in you fit in reasonably well with the culture that is around you, you're, the way that you're doing it is the easy way. You ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please yourself. And this comes down to me, this is like um, hospitality to strangers. You know, show kindness to foreigners because you were a foreigner in a foreign land. It's part of that where yeah, I'm comfortable, I'm safe, I have what I need, I fit in. This person is trying to uh, acclimate or trying to come in and trying to learn the ropes. It's my duty as a child of God to help and to be, you know, something of a guide, to give good advice, to, to help people assimilate, to accommodate their need. That's my role as a child of God. That's what this is about. Christ did not please himself. And the fifth verse of Romans 15, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. I tell you, Christ became a servant 
to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Again it is written, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. That is, all the nations extol him. Again, Isaiah, the root of Jesse will come. He who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. That's the conclusion. We reiterate, um, you know, five, six, seven. He's talking to Jew and Gentile together at Rome. He's told them the teachings of the law, the salvation by faith in Christ Jesus, which is an obedience to the gospel of the Lord. He's told them even how to get along in matters of judgment cultural tradition, things of this nature, how they ought to be concerned about one another. You are the family now of God, even though you came from different backgrounds and nations. That's why he says, Romans 15, 5 through 7, this is the centerpiece. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That's the point. And the testimony of the scriptures follows in eight through 12. That's what all this is. Christ was a servant to the circumcised in order to confirm promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So it's both. It's not Jew or Gentile. It's both. We need the Jew. We need the Gentile too. We need Israel. And Israel needs the nations. And we're all under mercy. We're all under forgiveness. Serving God. Then. We grab a little bit of something interesting. Romans 15, 25. At present. I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, because Macedonia and Greece have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it. Indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, which we have, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. So Macedonia and Greece, Achaia, realize that their spirits, their souls have been saved and that the truth has come to them and a savior has come to the world through the nation of Israel and that there are Israelites who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus and they're in a famine in Jerusalem. Now they're going to send money. They're going to send support, help these people buy what they need because they've reaped the spiritual blessings they are willing to impart material blessings. And as Paul said, indeed, they owe it to them. And there is that, there is that harmony there of the need. And you can compare it to first, uh, second Corinthians eight with the Lord loves the cheerful giver and the, the way in which the, you know, the needs uh, of some get filled, the, the, at this time, the needs of others at another time, perhaps now you have plenty and they have less and that may be reversed in the future. We will all give thanks. It's a very similar concept to what he's been saying in Romans about the, the uh, Israelites needing to be forgiven, to be reconciled to him and accept the Savior in the, and the Gentiles obtaining forgiveness because of Israel's rejection at first that this gospel spreads to all the countries around them. They're very similar. And he can say this now with all that background and they understand what he means. Yeah, it does make sense. We have strength, a position of strength. We have food, we have 
money, uh, you know, our nation is stable. They are suffering. So let us send them and supply their need since we have enough. Makes perfect sense now. But it would have been very hard to put these verses into chapter one. <laughs> he needs to show them and help them understand their position, their role first. And now that they get that, they're ready to accept this truth. That yes, it is owed to Israel. We ought to show them these material blessings. And finally, you go to that 16th chapter. And there are some really neat things happening in this chapter, as well as some scary things. But I will deal with this fairly quickly. You begin in chapter 1 to name individuals, some of whom we've heard of, in other places in scripture and some of whom we have not met. But one thing I will note is that there are all kinds of names in here. In verse one, we find Phoebe commended. That is a Greek name. In verse three, we speak of Prisca and Aquila, whom we know to be Jews from Rome who helped Paul. In verse 6, we see Miriam, which is clearly a Jewish name. In verse 7, Andronicus and Junia. Do you need to be told that those are Roman? <laughs> How much more Roman does it get? Uh, there are many of these names, and they know each other, and they're in different places. You see Kenkria at verse 1. And uh, uh, you see that Prisca and Aquila seem to be hosting the congregation in their house, perhaps, or just have family members who have obeyed the gospel one way or the other at verse 5. But they're somewhere else, not Kenkria. Uh, he's writing to Rome. A lot of these people must be there. There are quite a few names. We don't know who these people are, but the point of it is they do. The 16th verse, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send their greetings. When we say greet, it means say hello. <laughs> it just means say hello. Yeah, say hi with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ say hi. <laughs> All the assemblies tell you hello. That is from, from all the other places where I have been. They told me, they bid me say hello to the church there at Rome and the other congregations. It, it's saying they do know each other. The church is made of the people and the people know each other. They have names, they have reputations. They're known for what they do and for what they don't do in some cases, but they're known and they are named. Greek with a holy kiss is just how they do things in the Mediterranean to this day. We shake hands. They give a peck on the cheek. That's just how it is. It's a greeting. It's a hello. It's how you're personal and personable, loving and kind, that we show each other a preference, that we like to see each other, we're glad to see each other. And then there's a warning in the 17th. I appeal to you, brethren, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you've been taught. Avoid the, these people. So not only are the churches known, the individuals who make up the churches are known, and they're commended, as he lists here, but it's also the case that there are some who create division, who create controversy, whose teaching is error. And they also are known. Just as these people are known by name, the false teachers are known by name too. And you can see Paul naming them in his letters to Timothy, for example, among other places, there are quite a few places where you can see 
hey, they knew each other for better or for worse. There's a certain accountability about that, which is very appropriate in the Lord. Even the people who are there are getting in on it in verse 21. Uh, Timothy, my fellow worker, says hello. So do Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my kinsman. And then this fella, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. <laughs> so the guy who was actually writing this down, named Tertius, added his little hello. <laughs> Gaius, host to me and the whole congregation, greets you. Erastus, city treasurer. And all of this is, it's great. It's just brethren. They know each other. They love each other. They say hello. We try to be cheerful and cheer each other. And he closes it as is appropriate in 25, to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that had been kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the eternal God to bring about obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, it wraps up very nicely. This all fits. And we've been brought together as the children of God, um, whether Jew or whether Gentile, we've been brought together through faith to obedience of the faith. We are intended to know each other, to treat each other as brother and sister, regardless of what country or tradition we have come from, to put the interests of others above our own interests and show the love and kindness that is appropriate for the children of God. We ought to be known as loving and kind people. It's good. It's right. And you have every reason to be loving and kind. God has shown you great mercy. And we have many and precious blessings in Christ Jesus. So we're the strong. Let us help the weak. Let us help those in the world who don't know the Lord. Those who do not know the truth, who do not stand or do not have a place to stand. To help them with what is right. Let us be diligent in our uh, teaching, in our stance, in our rightness before the Lord. Today, are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent. Turn back to God. Remember your place and your role and fulfill it. God has invested in you. Give him a return. If today, as a Christian, you haven't lived right, uh, we're glad to pray with you. We're glad to help. Do you need to obey the gospel of Jesus? We will help you to obey him in baptism for forgiveness of sins based on your repentance. And God will gladly receive you. We want to do right towards you as well. If we can help you obey the gospel, if we can help you with our prayers, let us let us do so. Let it be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.